Today we want to understand how assumptions and the various aspects that we're dealing with go into our inferences about the parameters of the gravitational wave source and ultimately, of course, the fundamental physics, the astrophysics, whichever aspect of um, gravitational wave science you're interested in. Tyson gave this really, really beautiful overview on Monday. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat all of that, but just a brief reminder that what we're analyzing is actually calibrated strain data. And the word to emphasize here is calibrated, right? As you calibrate your detector, there's an error associated with that. So what is the impact of calibration errors? I think Sylvia will say a little bit about that in her talk later on. We also have here, if you look back at the beautiful talks we've seen this week, our data consists of some noise and hopefully a gravitational wave signal. Now, Tyson laid out very beautifully that we make a lot of simplifying assumptions when we describe the detector noise. The detectors don't always behave that beautifully and that trivially as we like to often assume when we actually evaluate the likelihood function. And so, how do the assumptions that we make about the noise propagate into the inferences on the source parameters? And last but not least, if you're interested in doing a modeled analysis, and that will be the main focus of today, Spoiler here, because what we have observed to this date is, of course, predominantly uh, coalescences of compact binaries, black holes, and neutron stars. And so if you do a model analysis, Juan was already hinting at that yesterday, we make a lot of simplifying assumptions in these models too. So how do these impact our inferences about the source properties? So overall, I think with every experiment, and that's also true for gravitational wave observations, we ask what is the error budget? And how do we actually assess the error budget and how do we mitigate impacts of errors on our inferences? And then, of course, you can ask, well, how robust are our measurements, actually? Are we in a regime where we are already dominated by systematic errors in our assumptions, or are we still OK because of statistical uncertainties? And for the majority of things, people will tell you it's all good. We can hide behind the statistical uncertainties at the moment. But looking into the future, the detectors improve significantly. So we will reach the regime where we want to make, and you can look at any white paper that has been written about you know, the next generation gravitational wave detectors, or even down the road five, six years for the A-plus upgrade to the LIGO detectors, we want to make precision measurements of X, Y, Z. Now, to do a precision measurement, you really need to understand your systematics very well. And here's an example from the latest observing one. This was GWU um, 190412. I'm sorry, I'm going to take this off because <laughs> I can't breathe. <laughs> Um, GW 190412, where we saw the first hints of disagreements in the analysis. The posteriors are still very broad, so you'd look at it and say, well, there's broad agreement. They're not dramatically different from each other, so I can, I can get away with that. But let's play the game and take this, as an, this binary, which had roughly an SNR of 20 in the detector network, and scale it to be a binary with an SNR of 100. Now, that's not outrageously loud, but it's also nothing we're probably going to see next year or in two years' time. But if you do that, you see how your width of your posterior scales is 1 over the SNR. And if I show you these posteriors, you probably go, oh, I'm not sure they, agree. they don't, definitely don't agree with each other, right? So what are you going to take away from that? Is it a binary with a mass ratio of roughly 3 or 4? That can have huge implications for the astrophysics you want to do with it for tests of general relativity, et cetera, you want to deal with it. And if this were neutron stars and not black holes, it could have severe implications for the upper mass cut, for example, the, mass, the, the, the maximum mass of your neutron star. So just to give you a feel, this is a toy model. I haven't actually scaled the data here. Um, but just to give you a feeling of what the potential shortcomings are going to be within the next couple of years already. Yes? Ah. So Garen's going to tell you all about that in the next talk. <laughs> so I'll, I'll keep the tension here. These are just two of the flagship models that we use that include Inspire, Merger, and Ringman. And they differ, to some degree, quite significantly in the physics assumptions they make. They both here include precessions and misaligned spins and higher order modes. And that's quite relevant, because this is clearly a binary that goes away from the equal mass limit here, where we expect an excitation of higher order modes. Um, but in the way they are constructed, they differ quite significantly. It's the waveform itself that we've seen here. Indeed, they use the same strain of data, the same calibration uncertainty assumptions, the same um, PSD in the analysis, everything else is the same. We've just swapped out the model here. OK? But yeah, I, I hope everybody looks a bit scared at this and thinks, ooh, we really need to do something about that. And it's everywhere, right? 
it's not just in this example of the binary bar calls. There's another one here, 1905-21, and Juan already talked about yesterday, where we also see broad consistency, but disagreements, small pensions, start to be creeping up. Test of general relativity is a really crucial one, right? So if we deform our general relativity waveforms to make some modifications to them that could generally capture some deviation from GR, you could potentially mimic quite a large deviation of GR, but just excluding some of the physics in your wafer models. And that's a paper from 2018 by Peter Pang with um, Juan's contribution on that as well. And this is, of course, not the situation you want to be in, right? The first deviation of GR you want to claim, you want to be very, very confident that you have actually detected the deviation from GR. So understanding the waveform systematics here, again, is really, really important. The same goes for the inference of the equation of state. Here's an example um, by work that Garen and myself have done where we've just chopped off some information in the tidal phasing. And how does it impact, for example, the estimation of the radius and the mass of the neutron star? And then, as we've seen from Charles and yesterday, how does it map back into the equation of state inference that we make? And that, of course, in turn, will then influence what nuclear physicists put into their models you know, astro astronomers who do X-ray observation and so on and so forth, right? Again, it's, it has an impact on the community and we need to be really, really careful. And Maya told us earlier this week about how posteriors from the single event inference feed into the population inference. So understanding our systematics and how to propagate in the population inference is also something really, really important, of course. And there are many, many more examples that just a few down here to give you a flavor of what we're looking at. Now, I'm not going to say any more other than give you a brief rundown of today's speakers. So we're starting off the morning session with Garen and Rosella, who will tell you about the waveform systematics, because that's something that's becoming quite crucial, um, quite obvious from the examples we have seen, but is also something that requires a lot of work to understand across a high-dimensional parameter space, and that's not a trivial task at all to do. These talks are then followed by Sylvia talking about PSD uncertainties, and I believe she's going to say a little bit about calibration uncertainties as well. And then in the afternoon, after the lunch break, we'll have Ben Farr join us virtually to talk about the impact of glitches. So violating the stationarity assumption that goes into the likelihood evaluation under normal circumstances, and how this impacts um, our inferences of the source properties. And then we'll have an extended discussion session, the final one, uh, this week, where we'll hopefully also hear about systematics in other gravitational wave experiments, such as PTA and upcoming LISA missions, and we'll talk, hopefully, a lot more about how we can potentially better assess them and develop strategies to mitigate these systematic biases in our observations. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Gary.